Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a CLP guest presentation by Carly Jewell. Uh, Carly recently su successfully completed the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Directorate Fellows Program, uh, working for the Science Applications Program, which is the program that I work for in the Southwest region. So a little bit of context on this just really quickly. Um, early last year, actually it was late last year, I worked with staff from Ecological Services and the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program, both within Fish and Wildlife Service, to develop a DFP proposal for work that was identified by priority by you all from the Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community Practice. Uh, we submitted that proposal, I believe, in December or so of last year, and then worked on revising the scope of the task during the spring of 2021. So with that, Carly worked on two major tasks this summer that she'll touch on today. Uh, the first was an assessment of nomenclature and definitions for introduced aquatic species in like our four Southwest dryish states, um, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and New Mexico. The second task was the development of a tool to help practitioners navigate regulatory needs while planning for projects. Carly is pursuing her master's in environmental science and management from Humboldt State University, where she's looking at citizen science, river otters, and effective science communication. She's also been working the last three years for a regional land trust, conducting scientific data collection, directing environmental education and interpretation programs, and implementing multiple use land management strategies. So with that introduction, I will hand it over to you, Carly. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Carly Jewell. My pronouns are she, her. I am a graduate student in the Environmental Science and Management Program at Humboldt State University uh, at, in Northern California, which is where I sit today. I, my thesis research really looks at uh, science communication, citizen science, and the North American river otter. Uh, and I'm really excited to share a little bit about what I worked on this summer through my Directorate Fellows Program, or DFP, opportunity with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, because it was totally different than a lot of what I spend my time researching in school. But for some context, the DFP program is an 11-week fellowship where fellows have the opportunity to work on projects that support Fish and Wildlife Service conservation priorities. And my position in particular was centered around providing support for the control of non-native aquatics. Um, and so my hope today is that we will really unpack kind of what that looks like. Let me know if I start having some technical difficulties and I'll try to troubleshoot. Otherwise, we'll jump in. So to give us just the quickest outline, I want to start by providing some context and background info, which I think will help set us up for the two main tasks that I dove into for the fellowship. I'll spend just a minute or two talking about recommendations and thoughts on next steps, and then we'll save some time at the end for questions. So I'm gonna start us off with what are non-native aquatics. Um, and I know that all of us have self-selected to be in a non-native aquatic community of practice. Uh, so that seems pretty straightforward. I'm not gonna spend much time here, but you will find later in my presentation that I spent a good amount of time during my fellowship looking at how definitions related to non-native aquatics can really vary uh, across state and federal entities. So it seems like a good opportunity to <laughs> give us a quick working definition for this presentation. So non-native aquatics range from algae to plants to predatory fish. And in certain contexts, some of these species are, are viewed as desirable. And in other cases, these species uh, have the potential to compromise infrastructure or negatively impact native species. And so my work over the summer revolved around thinking about non-native aquatics through the lens of how can my work support the non-native aquatic species community of practice and the collaborative conservation and adaptation strategy toolbox, or like most of us know it, CCAST. So with that, uh, a little bit of foundation set, my fellowship was really split into two priority tasks. The first task was an assessment and synthesis of nomenclature and definitions for a range of introduced aquatic species in 
Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and New Mexico. Uh, and back in June, some of you may remember, but I presented to the non-native aquatic community of practice related to kind of task one progress and findings. So I'm not really gonna spend much time talking about uh, this task, um, but I will give a brief recap and summarize findings as they relate to task two. And so task two was the development of a regulatory support tool that really is intended to help practitioners navigate regulatory needs when planning for non-native or aquatic invasive species projects, which is what we're gonna look at today. So task one in recap, I was really focused on identifying definitions for key terms, shared threats and conservation needs related to non-native aquatics in the four Southwest states I already mentioned, Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, and Utah. And I really did this through a literature and document review of state wildlife action plans, aquatic invasive species management plans, fishing regulations by state and state administrative code for all four of the Southwest states. And the different information that I was looking at was, you know, definitions for introduced aquatic species, species of greatest conservation need, aquatic invasive species, and sport fish by state. And as I briefly mentioned, um, I presented this info to the non-native aquatics community practice. And there were several kind of findings and feedback that really emerged from the presentation, uh, which I'm gonna share actually on the next slide. Um, but the non-native aquatic presentation itself prompted some follow-up kind of pop-up style calls related to funding constraints and regulatory hurdles that exist in non-native aquatic control work. And I want to talk about some of the outcomes from all of that. So for some findings, while it's not surprising, we'll start on the far left here, it's not surprising, right? Most states have definitions for invasive species, non-native species, endangered, threatened, aquatic invasive, et cetera. Uh, but there are some definitions across states that differ. So for example, uh, if we look at the term invasive species, one state has three different definitions provided for invasive species, including one that lumps invasive, exotic, and feral all together. Whereas another state has alien, non-indigenous, foreign, and exotic under the definition for non-native species. And finally, in one state, uh, they have multiple terms that share the same meaning, those terms being exotic, uh, aquatic invasive species, non-native, and non-indigenous. The second finding I want to touch on is really related to data usability. So feedback from the community of practice and others really suggested that the synthesized information from task one could be helpful for cross-state coordination and, and deepening dialogues related to large landscape scale collaboration. And the final finding, which really came out of the follow-up conversations with the community of practice, um, you know, funding constraints and regulatory hurdles were certainly identified as challenges in non-native aquatic work, but an additional challenge identified was related to work across different land ownerships, which I thought really brought to light the human dimension component involved in moving these projects forward. So I'll leave it there for task one, uh, but that brings us into task two. So kind of reflecting on those conversations with partners, I really elected to address the topic of regulatory hurdles and non-native aquatic control work. And to do that, I decided to build an online interactive regulatory support tool. And the tool itself is really designed to help project managers identify which permits and regulatory processes may be relevant for their own non-native aquatic control work, and then direct them to some resources uh, where more information can be found and provide some general timeline expectations for the different permit processes. 
So I did this using document and literature review, as well as working sessions with internal and external agency partners. And the tool is broken down into sections that guide users through a series of questions and flowcharts to really determine the applicability of, of four permits and regulatory processes. Um, those include the Clean Water Act, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, and Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Here. And what I want to do is I want to briefly take us to the tool to give a quick demo for how, um, how it can be used. But here's the tool. The initial page really orients users to the web tool, provides some general information related to non-native aquatics. Um, let's see, my internet is loading slowly. Um, what the tool is intended for, and then really how to use this tool. Like how can a project manager or practitioner come and understand the applicability of these permits to their projects? And so what I wanna do is run through an example. So let's say that a practitioner wants to understand the applicability of NEPA on their non-native aquatic control project. They would go to the page with NEPA and they would engage in this interactive compliance support forum, which will ask them kind of project related questions to really try to get them to a better understanding of whether NEPA is or is not applicable, right? So the first question being, does the project have a federal partner or nexus? Let's say for this fictitious example, it does. We we'll go next. And this next question is, will the project have impacts on the human environment? And so I want to also bring some attention to some of the built-in aspects of this tool that are trying to focus on supporting common uncertainties. So perhaps whoever is engaging in this tool um, isn't in the day-to-day -day thinking about permits and some of the language associated, such as like, what is the human environment, right? So this tool tries to build in um, some support there. You could say, well, I don't know, what is that? Uh, and it'll provide you with some additional support and narrative to try to help users get to um, their end, the end of this interactive tool and a better understanding of the applicability of some of these permits on their projects. And if someone were to continue down, uh, they could get just a brief snippet of information related to NEPA. Uh, they'll get some estimated timelines for the regulatory processes uh, across the different permits that we have. And then we also have these compliance charts. And I like to think of the compliance charts as kind of showing the inner workings of the interactive forms, which can really help folks who are interested in um, kind of back engineering their projects plan and design based on certain outcomes. And then other helpful information like, well, categorical exclusions by agency, things that are relevant for NEPA. Um, and so I'm going to toggle us back here. And what I want to spend just a minute or two talking about is next steps, looking to the future. And when I think back on the fellowship, you know, I learned a lot about the different ways that folks are engaged in landscape scale conservation for native aquatic species. And, you know, I found that work to be collaborative um, and really creating a space for scientific knowledge exchange and for practitioners to kind of connect with each other. And I think that there are, you know, I think continuing that work is vital. And I think there are some other ways we can build upon that work. So my general recommendation is that in order to have greater successes for native aquatic species, we need to really continue to think about and improve the way that we work with each other and our partners related to non-native aquatic control. Obviously that's a very multifaceted goal. And I think forums like the Non-Native Aquatic Community of Practice help us get there. I also think that 
the further refinement of this tool could help us get there. Um, you know, this tool provides regulatory support for common federal regulatory processes, but it could be built out further to really create a matrix of regulatory and permitting needs that captures what's required by different agencies and geographic locations in, you know, different situations. So knowing, right, that the regulatory process can be complex, it could be helpful if this tool was further broken down into sections, maybe by agency type or geographic location, uh, to try and better account for the complex and kind of nuanced nature of the regulatory uh, process. And then in addition to that, I think a new tool could be developed using a similar framework um, to synthesize funding opportunities that support non-native aquatic control work. You know, I think this tool similarly could be broken down by type of control work, geographic location, entity type, um, et cetera. But I think that that provides an opportunity to address some of the other challenges uh, that exist within non-native aquatic control work that have been identified by non-native aquatic community of practice members. And so with that, I just want to send some appreciation to the folks listed on the screen. You know, it was a really amazing summer experience and I felt super supported throughout the DFP position. And I think a large part of that was really due to these folks. So thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna go ahead and leave it there. Happy to answer any questions and thank you everyone for your time. Thanks, Carly. All right. Um, yeah, so like Matt said in the chat, um, this was a lot of work for 11 weeks. Um, so I think it's really awesome, Carly, that you got to where you did um, in that short amount of time. So thank you for that. Uh, we just have one question so far from the chat. Could you talk a little bit about like who you worked with and how you pop were able to populate the regulatory tools? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, kind of a a lengthy process there initially met, did kind of like a pop-up style meeting with the non-native aquatic community of practice to think about what would go into a tool like this. Um, and then taking some of that feedback, um, met with some internal agency partners, so people within US Fish and Wildlife um, to populate some of these forms. And then also was really fortunate to meet with some folks from the Forest Service um, and from Bureau of Reclamation to, to think about, you know, how could this tool be helpful um, to folks in other agencies on different land jurisdiction types. Um, and so basically, with a mix of, of meeting with different agency partners and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Agency partners, um, listening to the non-native aquatic community practice really shaped like what could be put into this tool that would be helpful in a time frame that was feasible. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Does anyone else have questions for Carly? Feel free to unmute yourself um, or put in the chat if you feel more comfortable with that. Give everyone a minute. So nothing else in yet, um, but feel free to put things in the chat if you'd like to. Um, I did want to express again, uh, Carly's heard me say this multiple times, but Carly, again, thank you for all your work this summer and for working with us. Uh, you're really a pleasure to work with and um, having somebody, somebody be able to come in for 11 weeks really focus on something, this is a huge benefit for us instead of folks like myself or Christy trying to build this slowly over time, it would have taken us 10 times as long. So really appreciate that. Um, mentions in the chat and Christy said as well, but 11 weeks is a lot of work. Um, Carly said a, a long process, which was about six weeks for the development of the regulatory support tool. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of great work. Um, Carly didn't mention that she also spent a I don't know how much time, but really well documented the process and the steps she took to, de to develop the product so that if there are pieces of this we decide to pick up and run with for the community practice, 
we have all the tools we need, as well as thinking about the next steps. So um, Carly being able to come in from an outside perspective and be with us for 11 weeks and say, here's what you all should do to fix it. That's basically what was in there, right, Carly? Um, <laughs> but really do appreciate that. And um, yeah, I hope that other folks here see see the value kind of in what this is, and hopefully uh, this will help us you know, continue to move things forward. Um, the only other thing I'll say, uh, Carly's fellowship officially ended two weeks ago-ish, and she's here on her own time right now. So Carly, appreciate you coming back to present the final outcomes here. And uh, hopefully this won't be the last uh, process we make for this work as we move forward. So thank you, Carly. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to share it. Um, you know, I was thinking about as I was jumping on today, just like, wow, this tool was really created with the hope that it would support this community of practice. So I hope it is helpful to folks moving forward and can be, you know, a, a source to think about like how we can continue to grow this work. So thank you. Appreciate that. And um, one thing Carly, I haven't told you yet is if we're gonna do a DFP proposal for next year, I have to do it within the next five days. <laughs> it turned around and it was crazy this year. So um, something else, if folks have feedback on next steps like re or related to the funding mechanism part of it, that could be something I could see us developing a DFP proposal for, for next year. Hopefully we'll get a little reprieve and we'll we need to turn that proposal around. Um, but with nobody jumping on here, feel free to reach out to me or Christy directly too, and just let us know if how you feel about this work, if there's clear next steps uh, for another outstanding person to come in and um, work on for 11 weeks next summer. So, awesome. Thank you for that.